Good day, friends. And on this occasion of World Diabetes Day, I'd like to thank all of you, each and every one of us, for working so hard to ensure access to diabetes care. I'd also like to thank all of us for doing our best not only to ensure access to diabetes care, but also to ensure access to effective and efficient diabetes care. The care that we offer our patients is evidence-based. That's why it's effective. That's why it's efficient. But you know, the person living with diabetes is much more than just a group of numbers or a series of numbers, the HB1C, the blood pressure, the cholesterol. There is much more to diabetes than these few numbers. That is why it sometimes becomes difficult to manage diabetes. And that is why you must have noticed it is relatively easy to have an algorithm for acute illness. Even if it is a difficult or severe illness, a life-threatening disease, like a heart attack, like stroke, like septic shock, you can create an algorithm and the ICU, the nursing staff, they will run on that algorithm. It is relatively more challenging to create an algorithm for diabetes. So 10, 20 years ago, when uh, stalwarts in the profession began trying to create guidelines from Europe, from America, it was a very prescriptive kind of a guideline. You see newer guidelines, newer recommendations now. In the beginning, they are all united, uh, saying that we should have lifestyle modification, metformin. And now for patients with ASCVD, established ASCVD, or those at high risk of ASCVD, we should have SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1-RA. But after that, things are left to the physician and the patient. What is the second line choice? What is the third line choice? When to prescribe insulin, when not to prescribe? All these are uh, person-centric, personalized, individualized decisions. Now, the fact that each person with diabetes is unique, the fact that you cannot have a prescriptive algorithm, this makes diabetes management difficult at times. But look at it from another point of view. All this makes diabetes management challenging, complex, and fun as well. You enjoy managing difficult diabetes because the happiness that you get, the satisfaction that you get at the end of that management, when you have a happy patient, when you have a healthy patient in front of you, that uh, happiness, that success cannot be counted in numbers. It is an intangible kind of a happiness. You cannot put a monetary value on that. So today, let's talk about managing difficult diabetes. And we look at simple tricks of the trade. I've been managing difficult diabetes for uh, over 25 years now. It's been 26 years in the field of endocrinology. And I'm still learning. I still continue to make errors. I must admit that. But uh, I am quite original, you know. Each time there's a new error to be made. And every day is a learning for me. One issue that I've faced is uh, how to approach the patient. We speak of holistic health. <clears throat> holistic means viewing the patient as one. But that means it's just one thing in front of us. What do I do with all the anatomy, the physiology and the biochemistry that I learned? I have learned that the human being is made up of the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, the brain, the kidneys. So shouldn't I reduce my patient to these organ systems? Going one step ahead, I have also learned that uh, each organ system is made up of cells. So shouldn't I view my patient from a cellular perspective? And why stop at that? Why not look at the cytoplasm, the nucleus separately? Each and every enzyme, each and every cofactor, each and every target protein separately. This is known as the reductionist approach. So the question has been, should we view our patient in a holistic manner? Or should we manage the patient in a reductionist manner? But then a counterpoint is, why bother about this question at all? Why should we have a either one or the other kind of an approach? Why can't we have both? Why can we not learn the biochemistry, the pathology, the pharmacology, the physiology of diabetes? That is a reductionist approach. 
and then apply it in an appropriate manner, in a holistic manner, leading to holistic outcomes. This is a question, it, it, may, it may seem a rhetorical question to some of us, holistic versus reductionist, but this is a question which uh, I grappled with for a long, long time in my career. I used to wonder why is it that patients uh, do not listen to us, but very happily listen to whatever they are fed by people from alternative medicine. The reason is that we are trained in pathology. So therefore, we are trained in reductionism. And our communication will be, you know, uh, something is wrong with your insulin receptors. Your AMP kinase is not working. If you do not take insulin, you will get albuminuria. This albuminuria is a cause of premature death. So you are going to die. Many times our tone is like that. It's a scary, uh, pathogenetic, non-confidence building kind of an approach. And patients don't like it. On the other hand, someone across the road will say, come to me, I promise you good health. I'll take care of you in a holistic manner. He just forgets, she just forgets to mention that uh, they do not know the difference between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. That is a separate matter, but the patient also doesn't know. So why should the patient bother? So come to me, I will take care of your health. I will make sure that your kidneys are healthy, both left and right. I will make sure that your heart and lungs are healthy and your brain remains okay. So come to me for holistic health. No wonder whom, whom the patient will choose, which doctor the patient will choose. What other people do in alternative medicine, that is up to them. But what we can do is we can move one step at a time. We can try to understand what diabetes is. So today we will speak about models to describe diabetes. We can then understand how to evaluate difficult diabetes how to assess it, history taking, examination, investigations, but all done in a systematic manner. So we will also talk about models of evaluation. And then we should understand why we are treating the patient in the first place. What is the definition of health for the patient, for the individual? So we'll talk about model outcomes as well today. And if we do this one step at a time, we will actually understand how we can construct a useful, effective, efficient treatment model for our patient. And then what you will find at the end of the next 40-45 minutes is that no diabetes will be difficult for you or for me. So let's deconstruct the subject of diabetes so that we can construct good health for our patients. <clears throat> like we said, we'll go one step at a time. So first of all, we talk about models for describing diabetes. Now, how do we describe diabetes in the OPD? For the non-diabetologist, diabetes is just one word. It should be homogeneous. But for us, it is not. Each and every patient is different. And each and every patient comes with a phenotype. Phenotype word in English means the sum of all external attributes. Glucophenotype in diabetes praxis means all the attributes, both clinical and biochemical, which allow characterization of glycemic status, so which allow us to characterize the current glycemic status or diabetes status, which also help us understand the etiopathogenesis of dysglycemia. So we understand the etiology and the problems in physiology, in regulation of that individual. So they tell us what is wrong with the patient, why it is wrong, what is the etiopathogenesis issue, and what we can do. The glucophenotype helps us plan therapeutic strategies. This is not difficult. Now see glucophenotype. One patient may come to you with fasting hyperglycemia. You understand that the etiopathogenesis is insulin resistance in the liver. When you take a history, suddenly you realize, aha, the patient is a shift worker. That is why fasting glucose may be high. Or maybe you take a history and you find out that the patient drank one liter of full cream milk before going to bed. So obviously fasting glucose will be high. Or maybe the patient uh, took three pegs of whiskey and took fried snacks also along with that. So fasting hyperglycemia, that is the glycemic status, the etiopathogenesis in history, you are finding out what's wrong. 
and now planning therapeutic strategies. Once you found the etiology, uh, you might wish to change the quantity or the type of milk or beverages that the patient takes at night. You might want to focus on sleep hygiene. You may just wish to give non-pharmacological intervention or you might want to give a non-benzodiazepine drug like a Lemborexant to improve uh, the sleep and thereby reduce fasting glucose. Or it just might be a matter of increasing the dose of metformin at night. So that's glucophenotype. Look at another example. A patient with uh, fasting hyperglycemia, maybe 200, and postprandial hyperglycemia as well, 350. Now, if you give basal insulin alone, this patient will not respond. So you see that the glycemic status is both fasting and prandial hyperglycemia. The etiopathogenesis, uh, probably <laughs> insulin deficiency, maybe insulin resistance as well, precipitated perhaps by an acute infection that the patient has. You take a history and you find out it is recurrent balanopostitis. Now, this helps us plan therapeutic strategies. You have to give an insulin which will cover both fasting and prandial glucose. It can be premixed, it can be basal bolus. But along with that, you will have to manage the balanopostitis. Otherwise, the glucose will not come back to normal. So this is glucophenotype. But in our OPD, uh, when I used the word glucophenotype, I found it very dry. It didn't give me a very human kind of a feeling, a very humane kind of a feeling. And then we started using the term glycemic personality. Now, each and every patient comes to me with a personality of his or her own. I enjoy being with them. Well, with most of them, they are very friendly. They share their uh, worries, their concerns with me. They trust me. They all have different personalities. And glycemic personality means the sum of all attributes, both biomedical and psychosocial, which influence the glucophenotype of an individual. When I began using the word glycemic personality, suddenly it made my OPD much happier, much more human. And I think I've become a more humane endocrinologist after that. Each and every patient of mine comes to me with a different sapio type. S-A-P-I-O, sapio type. Now, sapio means uh, intelligence. So you see, like we are homo sapiens. Earlier, we used to call ourselves homo sapiens. That means uh, that species of the homo genus, which is intelligent. But a few years ago, we changed our name and we now call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens, which means that species of the Homo genus, which is intelligent and which knows that it is intelligent. Uh, from sapiens, we have sapio and each and every patient of mine has a different sapio type. Some are very intelligent. They are literate. They are numerate. Others may not be literate and numerate, but they may be health literate, health numerate. So they understand what's going on with their health. I manage those differently. There are others who are illiterate, innumerate, and they don't want to improve their literacy level also about diabetes, about health in general. So those we manage differently. That is the intelligence quotient or the sapio type. Apart from that, there are other issues as well. And uh, another one is the psychotype. Some people are always uh, worried, afraid, tense, concerned about their diabetes. Others are calm, composed, confident. Both of them we handle differently. Then there's a sociotype as well, socio. Here, there are some people who are willing to open up they say, yeah, I have support from my family, my community. Uh, I have disclosed my diabetes. Uh, please help me. There are others who are a bit reserved and they will say, you know, uh, I have diabetes, but please don't tell my wife or please don't tell my mother-in-law. Otherwise, they'll kick me out of the family. And please don't tell my colleague at all. Otherwise, I will not get a uh, raise or I will not get promoted in my company. That is a different sociotype. So now again, you see and you realize as we are speaking that in our OPD, we have different glycemic personalities, both biomedical and psychosocial attributes contribute to the personality and the sapio type, the patient's intelligence, the patient's emotional level and the patient's social interaction all contribute to the glycemic personality. 
And now suddenly this rings a bell. Yes, there was this patient in my OPD yesterday who was so afraid. She was so concerned. She had a different personality. I treated her differently. I offered her psychological first aid. I calmed her down. I reassured her. And only then did I begin to speak about insulin or tablets. Had I not calmed her down or reassured her, she would not have listened to me even otherwise. The outcome would not have been good. On the other hand, the next patient who came in was a happy-go-lucky kind of a guy. His sugar was 350. But he said, Dak Saab, it's a season of festivals. It's Diwali season. Why do you grudge me one laddu extra or one uh, rasmalai extra? Uh, speaking of uh, rasmalai, uh, this uh, beautiful song on rasmalai coming from Gokte Sahab, uh, one of the best content creators on Instagram and Facebook. So Rasmalai is his favorite uh, sweet and it's mine as well. So uh, this happy-go-lucky guy, uh, you don't have to reassure him. He's already reassured, but you have to you know, bring him back to normal. Okay, boss, uh, once in a while is fine. Now Diwali is uh, done and dusted. Uh, we can't take the Rasmalai or Laddu out of your stomach now. But uh, now going forward, let's come back to normal, please. Let's take care of our, of our glucose. And another person, again a different glycemic personality, who finds fault in everybody in the world except himself or herself. Sir, why is my sugar 201? It is all your fault. I have been paying you 5,000 rupees for the past one year and you haven't been able to get my sugar down to 199. The fact that the patient didn't take the medicine at all, that is a separate matter. But it is your fault. So there's a different glycemic personality. We face many such patients in Haryana where I work. But then we enjoy dealing with them as well. So this is what glycemic personality is. And so far, we are still on the first part of our talk today, which is trying to create models for describing diabetes. But what you see so far is that uh, we have different types of persons with diabetes and we can actually describe their glucophenotype or their glycemic personality in objective terms. It is necessary to do that. It is imperative. It is mandatory to do that because if you don't do it, short, short way of losing track and getting in trouble with difficult diabetes. So this sure mnemonic helps us in a very sure, short manner of understanding how to approach diabetes. And this tells us about the glycemic personality of the patient. Two action-oriented domains. S is for severity and style of hyperglycemia. U is for utility and urgency of control. Somebody with very high glucose levels, someone may have fasting or postprandial or both hyperglycemia. Each patient will be treated differently. Like we said, this is the glucophenotype. Some people may require rapid control. Somebody with the pyelonephritis, you have to control immediately. Somebody who needs an elective surgery after a week, somebody who needs an urgent surgery tonight, you have to manage differently. However, there may be some patients where you go slow, someone at the very end of life, another person who perhaps uh, maybe has a CA gallbladder with multiple metastasis and patient is not doing very well, you, there's not too much of uh, utility in achieving tight control in such a patient. There are two caution-oriented domains as well. R is risk of hypoglycemia. During the daytime, at night, assess both separately. Risk of iatrogenic complications, maybe uh, edema, heart failure, GI disturbance, uh, genital tract infection, assess these. So caution is mandated by understanding the risk of hypoglycemia and iatrogenic complications. Uh, caution is also reinforced by understanding the enthusiasm and education of the person and family. That is the sapiotype. How intelligent are they? What is the psychotype and what is the sociotype? So severity and utility of severity of hyperglycemia, utility and urgency of control. These tell us how aggressive to be in diabetes care. Risk of hypo and complications, enthusiasm and education. These tell us how slow to go, how cautious to be. This is something that I use in my OPD routinely and I would recommend this. Do a sure analysis of each and every patient who comes to you. Create a glycemic personality in your mind before you begin discussion. But another and more complete method of understanding the glycemic personality, from sure, we move to assure. So assure your patient 
And apart from the other aspects that we've spoken about, look at the associated complications and comorbid conditions. If your patient has diabetes and heart failure, both have to be treated together. If your patient has diabetes and kidney disease, diabetes and infection, pruritus, valvae, tuberculosis, both have to be managed together. S is for sensitivity and social realities. We have spoken about that again and again. S is also for severity and style of hyperglycemia. U for utility and urgency of glucose lowering. And R for risk of hypoglycemia. E is for expected efficacy of various glucose lowering therapies. Now, if the patient has diabetes for 12 years, HbA1c is 12%. You are not going to gain much by starting four or five oral drugs. So you might as well give insulin. So the glycemic personality can be assessed by the assured mnemonic as well. So now you see, so far, we've been able to evaluate our patients. I follow sure, assure also, you can add the A for associated complications and comorbidities. And when you deconstruct your patient this way, you can actually construct a management plan. But so far, we have just done the problem statement. We've taken the problem of the patient. Now, how do we evaluate? How do we move forward? Let's come to the second part of our talk. And here we have what we call the 7D framework, but we will simplify it into the 3D framework, three-dimensional framework. In uh, medicine, in community medicine, we speak of the biopsychosocial model of health. Biopsychosocial model of health. We have biomedical determinants, psychological and social determinants of health. We also have biomedical psychological and social outcomes that we want in good health. We use a similar framework in diabetes, in difficult diabetes, and we call this the biopsychopharmacological model. Let me talk about this. So we'll do a 3D framework, and then we will further move on to 7D. The three Ds are, the three dimensions are biomedical, psychosocial, and pharmacological. In each of these, we have two or three sub-themes. So in biomedical, now our topic today is difficult diabetes. In biomedical, first of all, revise your diagnosis. Does the patient actually have diabetes? And what is the type of diabetes? Secondly, apart from diagnose, look at disease. So does the patient have any concomitant disease or comorbidity? What other dysfunction does the patient have? What other disability does the patient have? The second domain is psychosocial. And here we have three things to talk about. First is dialogue between us and our patient. Does the patient trust us? Are we able to communicate properly with the patient? What is the discipline that we have in daily life? Our patient, is he or she disciplined? And does the patient have any distress that we've not been able to manage? So you do a biomedical analysis, diagnose the type of diabetes, diagnose any concomitant comorbid disease. Do a psychosocial analysis, see if our, di our dialogue is optimal, see if discipline is adequate, and see if there is any distress that we missed out. The third dimension is pharmacological. And here we look at whatever drug the patient has been taking earlier, whether we have prescribed or somebody else has prescribed, is there a mistake in it? Maybe two sulfonylureas together. Maybe uh, the wrong insulin being given at the wrong time. And also the delivery system. Is the insulin, insulin being injected correctly at the right time? Is the tablet being given correctly at the right time? So let me repeat three Ds. Biomedical, psychosocial, pharmacological. Let us do the seven Ds below these. Diagnosing the disease, the type of diagnosis, the type of diabetes, and diagnosing the disease, concomitant disease. Dialogue, discipline, and distress. Three things in psychosocial domain. Drug choice and delivery of the drug. Two domains in pharmacological. Let us do these one by one now. And we'll do psychosocial first because the vast majority of your difficult to control diabetes will have a psychosocial element to it. And if you can master this, then you're a good diabetologist, a good endocrinologist. How does mastering this come? From practice, from making mistakes and from not repeating your mistakes again. It also comes from being a bit humble. Be able to listen to your patient, be humble. So make sure that you have a good dialogue with your patient. Does your patient trust you? 
communicate keep on motivating your patient be a coach motivate them even if there's something wrong don't depress them don't scare them tell help them to come out of it and do that sapio type analysis the glycemic personality analysis each person requires a different type of motivation sometimes uh, we get irritated i get irritated when you know i tell my patient uh, let me give you insulin and maybe four doses a day so patient says i am taking insulin which one two doses a day but i say there are 20 different types of insulin so i feel i know more than my patient but i was brought down to earth once by a very humble a very poor patient of mine she was from a migrant community and they used to make uh, chappals leather chappals leather slippers for a living Uh, and uh, what i realized when i spoke with her is that i know only one english word for leather which is leather and i know only one punjabi or haryanvi or hindi word for leather which is chamdi but this lady from rajasthan she knew 20 different types of names for leather she had a different name for old leather for rough leather for hard leather she had a different name for soft supple leather so who is more intelligent in the leather domain my patient is more intelligent so once you once you understand this then i think dialogue becomes easier and you are able to communicate at an equal level with your patient you have to be humble the second aspect is discipline so talk to your patient about diet physical activity stress management also adherence to therapy speak with your patient about distress as well understand what diabetes distress is any extreme emotions like dejection fear uh depression any extreme emotions which are caused by a perceived inability note the word perceived which are caused by a perceived inability to cope with the challenges and demands of living with diabetes so our patient is dejected because our patient thinks that she cannot cope with diabetes we told her last time you have to buy a glucometer she thinks she cannot afford it it may cost 1 lakh rupees how do we know what she thinks until we speak about that or she thinks okay i can buy the glucometer it cost 2000 rupees but uh, i don't know how to prick myself it hurts me or i can prick myself also but i don't understand the numbers i have never read anything maybe she has cataract or retinopathy she can't read properly so these are the things that may cause distress you find out what the reason is and you fix it properly let me reinforce five s's s that we have to talk about s is for sensible sustenance that's diet s for structured physical activity and sports s is for stress management as well s is for sleep hygiene and s is for substance abuse avoiding substance abuse so all these factors we have to speak about until you listen to your patient you will not be able to find out the reason for difficult to control diabetes so i would suggest that we listen with both ears open use your ears as stethoscope and listen the way you would want to be listened to yourself listen to your patient in such a way that you love to be spoken to speak with your patient also speak with your patient in such a way that you love to be listened to speak in a soft and cheerful manner in an optimistic manner all these many of us will say now it is easy to say daksa but in a difficult opd in a busy opd it is difficult to manage all this we can do it all you need to do is smile and smile from inside be empathic be compathic with your patient empathy means being able to put yourself in the person's feet shoes and compathy means being able to put yourself in the person's heart so when you tell your patient yes i understand how difficult it is not to eat those tasty sweets i understand how difficult it is to arrange money for insulin if you say it from the heart that is compathy don't say oh poor little fellow so much of cost on you so much of burden you will die a premature death that is sympathy that is not required but psychosocial issues alone do not manage diabetes and we have to focus on biomedical issues so let me talk about two aspects where we often make a mistake the first is diagnosis of diabetes does the patient have diabetes or stress hyperglycemia does the patient have type 2 diabetes or maybe autoimmune diabetes type 
maybe the patient has pancreatic diabetes. Perhaps the dysglycemia is because of drugs like uh, glucocorticoids, immunosuppressants, antipsychotics, the modern ones, and the drugs used in HIV, the older ones. Many a times, the diagnosis of type of diabetes cannot be done in a cross-sectional manner on one visit. You may have to do a longitudinal follow-up. And there's no harm in telling the patient. So we tell the patient, yes, as of today, we are treating you as type 2 or type 1, but there is something known as one and a half diabetes and it can always change. So we'll keep on watching you. We'll be careful and we'll get to know whatever tests are required, HB1C, urine ketones, maybe a C-peptide. Very rarely, we'll get them done every now and then. So uh, revisit your type of diabetes diagnosis. It is possible that we are treating somebody as type 2 diabetes while actually he or she has LADA late onset autoimmune diabetes. It is also equally possible that the patient may have pancreatic diabetes and we have missed that out. So how do you figure out these patients? In patients with LADA, uh, this is speaking from a Northwest Indian perspective, patients will usually be fair for their particular ethnic group or caste. They will be handsome men, beautiful women, light colored hair, light colored eyes, beautiful eyes, stigmata of autoimmune disease, such as goiter, vitiligo, arthritis, arthralgia. History of good control for a few months after diagnosis of diabetes and then progressively worsening diabetes. Weight loss. Uh, consider insulin in such patients. Tell your patient you may have one and a half diabetes. Let's give you insulin and see what happens. We also have a lot of patients with pancreatic diabetes. And uh, pancreatic diabetes is easy to diagnose if you know how to pick it up. These patients will be lean and thin, usually dark complexioned for their ethnic origin. They will have stigmata of malnutrition. Uh, the hair, the skin, the nails, they will be unhealthy. And they will also have gastrointestinal abdominal symptoms as well as maybe signs. So you may have steatoria, diarrhea, abdominal pain. So pick these up as well. There will be some patients with type 1 diabetes who are not responding to control. In them, we rule out other autoimmune diseases such as celiac disease and thyroid disease. So be aware of the different types of diabetes and try to pick them up. You can also pick up MODI every now and then, that is majority onset diabetes of the young. This will usually occur in younger people. There will be a very, very strong family history of early onset diabetes at a younger age. And the dysglycemia usually, usually is uh, mild to moderate and the patient is not very symptomatic. In very young children, another type of uh, monogenic diabetes is called neonatal diabetes. Now in pediatrics, the term neonate is used up till 28 days of age. In diabetes, we use it up, in pediatrics, it's up till 28 days. In diabetes, we use up till one year of age. So any child developing diabetes at a very early age, uh, three months, six months, nine months, think of neonatal diabetes. You may be able to treat with sulfonylurea. So be aware of the type of diabetes. Also be aware of concomitant diseases that may cause diabetes. If you miss out these diseases, any autoimmune disease, any uh, infectious disease, trauma, endocrine diseases, then we'll not be able to control. So think of three endocrine causes for difficult to control diabetes. Hyperpituitary. Hyperpituitary, that is acromegaly Cushing syndrome hyperthyroid, Graves' disease, and hyperadrenal, that is Cushing syndrome again. Obesity per se, insulin resistance. In hyperadrenal pheochromocytoma as well, all these can also lead to difficult to control diabetes. A simple mnemonic that I use in my OPD, I rule out any kind of infection from head to toe. Infection, inflammation, injury. Ischemia. Any invasive procedure that has been performed, any iatrogenic intervention, whether by myself or by a colleague from uh, Western medicine, by a colleague from alternative care, and any intensive issue, sudden change, all these we rule out when we try to assess difficult to control diabetes. We now come to our third domain, which is pharmacological. And this is equally important. Whenever you are assessing a person with difficult to control diabetes, First of all, we did the psychosocial assessment. Was our dialogue okay? Does the patient trust us? 
is the patient is in is the patient in distress is there any issue in daily discipline we then went on to the biomedical aspects we revisited our diagnosis of type of diabetes and we ruled out any other concomitant disease but apart from that we have to do a pharmacological history so see what drugs the patient is taking what is the drug class which molecule is it what is the preparation may be sustained or immediate release metformin that also will have an impact on fasting glycemia and then see how the drug is being delivered especially with insulin is the timing the frequency the site correct even for tablets is the patient taking the tablet before meals or after meals all this makes a difference especially for uh, newer drugs like semaglutide oral semaglutide has to be given 30 to 60 minutes before a meal with a maximum of 100 to 120 ml of water is the patient following that advice all this history taking is important because without this we will not be able to move ahead uh one method that i use in my opd to assess the difference or to assess the relative impact of psychosocial versus biomedical issues is the glucocoper the glucocoper is a validated tool uh, developed in india and here we look at six different methods of coping for the patient so anybody with difficult to control diabetes you ask the patient are you very negative do you keep on thinking about extremely negative thoughts like i want to commit suicide or persistently negative 24 hours a day you are thinking about diabetes and its negative steps blame do you keep on blaming yourself or somebody else maybe my me the doctor for your diabetes or poor control these are negative coping mechanisms negativity and blame persistent negativity extreme negativity self blame other blame if these are very high then the chance of a psychosocial element of difficult diabetes is higher if however these are relatively low and your patient seems to have accepted the diagnosis of diabetes is overall optimistic and is usually engaged in planning and action and the patient says you know yeah doc sir tell me what should i do what test should i get done which medicine should i take yeah whatever medicine you say i'll go and buy from the chemist and show you if the patient is in accepting optimistic mode in planning and action style all the time then the chances of a biomedical cause of poor diabetes control is higher so this glucocoper helps us understand which way to go how often to uh, investigate or how aggressively to investigate a patient now so far we have talked of uh, uh, how to assess our patients we spoke about gluco phenotype we then talked about glycemic personality and we used the word sapiotype the intelligence type in sapiotype we talked about psychotype or emotion we also talk about cognitive type that is the iq numeracy literacy and then we talked about sociotype the social skills and the social relationship of the patient we then understood the 7d model and 7d we simplified as 3d the biomedical domain the psychosocial domain and also the pharmacological domain we first talked about psychosocial aspects and we spoke about uh, taking a history regarding distress discipline and ensuring good dialogue with the patient in biomedical we talked about the disease diagnosis type of diabetes and then we talked about the disease diagnosis comorbid diseases in pharmacological Uh, we spoke about taking a di uh, a drug history what is the type of drug the dose the combination and what is the delivery is the method of ingestion the method of injection correct or not to understand the relative importance of psychosocial versus biomedical aspects of difficult diabetes we use the glucocoper is the patient in negativity and blame all the time or is the patient in accepting mode optimism or in uh, uh, planning and action mode all the time that helps us decide how to move ahead and by now we have all realized that yeah we are doing these things in our opd but we are not doing them systematically if we just make a checklist in our mind and even if it is difficult i just write this on a paper in front of me for every patient who comes to me i do a checklist especially for 7d this will help me minimize my errors it will help me do better but then what is the definition of better 
So let's spend a few minutes speaking about this. Hierarchy of goals and goalposts. And let's understand what the Maslowian pyramid is. Now, uh, Maslow was a, a, a behavioral psychologist who said that at the very bottom of his pyramid, everybody needs roti kapada makan. Everybody needs a food, clothing, shelter. Only when you have food, clothing and shelter, only then do you move towards a higher level, which is love and belonging. When every human being wants love and belonging. And then after that, you move towards higher things. Like then maybe you want to become president of the physicians association in your uh, city. If you don't have the basics like food, clothing and shelter, you will never think of wanting to become a president of Rotary Club. Similarly, in diabetes, we all speak of uh, cardiovascular health. But the point is we forget this hierarchy. First and foremost, our patients want symptomatic well-being. They want their symptoms to be corrected. So we offer that to the patient. If your patient says, sir, my chief complaint is increased micturition. And then you write an SGL to inhibitor. That is not good medicine. First, fix up the symptom. Prove to the patient that you can fix up the symptom. You may improve this symptom, increased micturition, by giving a good glucose-lowering drug, which can be sulfonylurea metformin or insulin. You may have to give nitrofurantoin. You may have to give a medicine for benign prostatic hypoplasia. That you will do based on clinical sense. But the point is, first of all, give symptomatic well-being. Only once that is achieved, then we focus on glucose. Yeah, let's bring your glucose down to normal. Let's bring the HB1C down to 7. At the same time, we have to avoid hypoglycemia. In you, madam, an HB1C of 6.5 can easily be achieved. But in your father, 7.5 or 8 should also be fine. So that is glucometabolic optimization. Once you have achieved this, only then do you have a right to expect that your patient trusts you. And then we move on to vasculometabolic benefit. Yeah, madam, let's give you a medicine which helps your kidneys, which helps your heart. We actually have medicines now which not only help your kidney and heart, they save them from damage and we can actually postpone premature death. We can increase your longevity. We can improve your longevity by giving these drugs. So we can kill three birds with one stone. We will give you symptomatic well-being, glucometabolic well-being and vasculometabolic optimization. In fact, ma'am, four birds, because we can also use this drug, GLP-1 RA or SGL-2 inhibitor, to improve your barrow phenotype, your adipose topography, and we'll help you reduce a few kg as well. But if your patient comes to you with, let us say, uh, loss of appetite, and then you say, let me talk about barometabolic optimization. Let me help you reduce your weight. Patient will be very unhappy with you. Patient will go and find a different doctor. Patient will say, doctor didn't even listen to me. I was complaining of loss of appetite. And the doctor said, you have to lose weight because you are 3 kg overweight or your BMI is 25.9. So this is the hierarchy that we have to follow. Whatever stage your patients come to you in, first you address that. And then you move one step ahead, one step ahead, one step ahead. And this is how you go below, like we have written. Start with symptomatic and glucose well-being. Move on to vasculometabolic and barometabolic optimization. And then ask about other things. Can we help your skin? Maybe you have pruritus. Any gonadal issues in sexuality, fertility? How's your liver doing? How are your joints and muscles and bone doing? So this is the order in which to behave. And who gives you the order? It is the patient. Listen to the patient. See at what step your patient is, address that and just go one step ahead. Don't jump from one to five. Also be aware about the concept of fluidity. Sometimes you want an HB1C less than seven, other times six and eight may also be okay. So it depends upon what the patient wants and don't uh, fight the patient, flow, roll with the resistance. At times you will be aggressive because the patient has got a concomitant infection. At other times, you will be relaxed because maybe patient has got renal impairment and you want to avoid hypoglycemia at all costs. There are some times where guidelines may not work and this is also difficult to control diabetes. So just use what we call common sense or good clinical sense here. So patients with severe hyperglycemia, don't follow the stepwise approach. Go straight with the insulin, with basal bolus, premixed with triple oral therapy, whatever is required in that particular situation. Patients with symptomatic diabetes, address the symptoms first. 
then talk about CV risk benefit. Secondary diabetes. Our guidelines are meant for type 2 diabetes, not for secondary diabetes. So fix up the cause. Pancreatic diabetes, Cushing, acromegaly, corticosteroids, all will have a different type of management. In patients on prednisolone or methylprednisolone, you always have to give extra dose at lunchtime because the highest glucose is seen in the evening. Many times, NPH insulin given twice a day will help improve glucocorticoid-induced diabetes. Patients with pancreatic diabetes will also need endocrine replacement, exocrine replacement. They will need pancreatic enzyme replacement because without that, they will not be able to absorb food. In pancreatic diabetes, you have to go very slow. Use small, frequent doses of insulin. Analog insulin is preferred. The reason for giving smaller doses is that in pancreatic diabetes, the alpha cell is also damaged. So there's no glucagon. So you've lost one counter-regulatory hormone. So go slow. And in endocrine disorders, treat the cause before you move ahead. Treat the hyperpituitary, hyperthyroid, or hyperadrenal while managing diabetes. In patients with sick diabetes, whenever they have an acute or chronic complication, treat according to the complication. If there is a comorbid condition like infection, inflammation, injury, or invasive iatrogenic procedure, manage accordingly. And in special situations such as pregnancy, adolescence, renal hepatic impairment, again, go care, be careful. Difficult to control diabetes includes some of the following. And in all these, basically, we will need basal bolus insulin. So strife is the word that helps us remember. Strife suggests infection that is associated with S for severe hyperglycemia. T for threat to life, limb or organ. Limb threatening, life threatening, organ threatening. Infection that is R, refractory, recurrent or resistant. In all these, you will have to give insulin for a short period of time. Otherwise, you will not be able to overcome the infection. So any severe, hyperglycemic, life threatening, refractory, recurrent, resistant infection or any infection that requires I for intervention with surgery or maybe glucocorticoids. With impaired function, cardiac, renal, hepatic, GI or excess excessive loss of life or excessive antimicrobial therapy. In all these, it's a good idea to start with basal bolus insulin so that you can bring the glucose down. Don't go on the guidelines. Just focus on the patient in front of you. And I'd like to conclude with this uh, quote from a book by Abraham Verghese, Cutting for Stone. In this, he frequently uses the word good clinical sense, the phrase good clinical sense, and also the phrase therapy by the ear. This is what we should try to follow. Use your ears as a stethoscope. So listen to the patient. All the difficult to control diabetes will become non-difficult. And speak also. Use your patient's ear. Use your patient's ear as a mode of treatment. And administer what Abraham Verghese calls words of comfort. Words of comfort and what we would call therapeutic patient education through the patient's ears. So educate the patient. Involve the patient in his or her management and you will find that diabetes practice will become fun. It won't be difficult anymore. We should follow evidence-based medicine, but at times you may have to follow logic as well. So logical empiricism would mean that yes, my patient has got tuberculosis. It will take a long time for glucose to come down if I give metformin. So let me start insulin. That would be logical empiricism. Another example of logical empiricism would be perhaps my patient has got uh, GDM, gestational diabetes, and has reached 38 weeks of pregnancy. She is doing fine. The guidelines tell me to take up till 39 weeks, but the patient comes from 100 kilometers away. And uh, it is post monsoon. There are more potholes than road where she has to go back to, and she has to go back by public transport. So why doesn't she stay here, deliver, and go back with a healthy baby? Because if I send her back on that pot pothole ridden road, she might deliver in the bus. That also is logical empiricism. Uh, so today, dear colleagues, we've spoken about difficult to control diabetes. And I think we did not share anything difficult. First, we talked about how to describe diabetes. Glycemic personality, glucophenotype, sure, assure, sapiotype. We then talked about how to evaluate diabetes. 7D model, 3D model, biomedical, psychosocial, and pharmacological. How to differentiate between focus on biomedical and psychosocial, 
use the glucocopper. Make sure that your dialogue is uh, adequate, is optimal. And then we talked about model outcomes. What is the outcome that we are aiming for? If you aim only for an HbA1c, only an HbA1c less than 7, 50% of the time you will fail. So diabetes management will become difficult. But if we change and we say, yes, my patient wants symptomatic relief, that is my outcome. My patient wants good glucose levels. She just wants that she doesn't have to get up to go to the bathroom at night. My patient wants that there should be whatever methods of CV risk reduction are there, I should be taking them. Whatever the patient requires, you deliver that and go one step ahead. Try to keep on improving. As a good coach, try to take your patient beyond their definition of health and add one more. But that should be done in a stepwise manner. And finally, we've learned this concept of therapy by the ear. Listen and speak in such a way that you would want to be uh, listened to yourself, that you won't want someone else to speak to you. And if we can do that, we'll certainly be able to manage all the diabetes that comes our way. And we will be able to contribute towards making our great nation a much happier and a much healthier country, society. And we'll contribute to making our patients, our fellow citizens, hale and hearty and happy and living in harmony with each other. Thank you and Jai Hind.